anyone in the audience want to take out? Sure. Um, I think, you know, hearing this, this conversation, one thing that I think about is that there, there may be evidence out there that all of us here would agree is basically credible evidence. And that one of the things that I see as important in thinking about how research translates to policy is that sometimes policymakers are interested in, in they may be interested in evidence, but they, they're more avid consumers of certain things that we may come up with. So the, the access question, for example, extremely avid consumers of, and, and we would say there's good evidence behind that. And the quality question, they're not avid consumers of. And then we find that maybe because there's some good evidence on, on access, those interventions have cut out everything else, right? Uh, and I don't think that we spend that much time thinking, you know, I, and I mean, the, it's not clear what we can do about it, but, but basically how different pieces of knowledge that we produce are going to be consumed. Because if, if the demand for one type of evidence or for one type of finding is much stronger than for other types, it's going to be much harder to say, well, we think we know three things and this is how we would order them if the, the market, so to speak, is only interested in point one, point two, or point three. And that's, that's one thing that I think of in, in thinking of for example, this, this access versus quality discussion. Any other comments? I, I mean, I could respond to that. Sorry, if there's an, oh, sorry, there's another comment. Did you ask to say something there? Just uh, two things. One, uh, Doug, you talked about you know, getting outside of the basic uh, schooling, which I'm sympathetic to, but you only want one direction. Whereas I think there is substantial evidence you should, Diffin should be thinking about going the other direction to the preschool direction as well, not just the secondary. The second is kind of related in a way to Rick and, and Mike, I guess to everyone, but I'm more skeptical that you know, one experiment in one place, one which shows really good results, is easily transferable to some other place. Uh, I think context matters a lot, and context includes market, cultural, other policies, um, for worms, the environment. I mean, you know, as you said, you're talking about a certain area in Kenya, but yet. You know, some people, because of your research, think you know, deworming ought to be the first thing that anyone thinks of, even where this is not a major problem. Uh, I'm not blaming you, but I have seen that sort of a claim. Um, and relatedly, I mean, this is you know consistent with your desire to have, uh, or maybe more Rick's desire to have support for evaluation. Uh, what bothers me somewhat, though, is you very quickly get vested interest in any program that started. And you, know, you, you, you start a, whatever your, your favorite program is, uh, in a context in which uh, it's really not uh, appropriate, but you do establish a vested interest in maintaining that. Uh, and so in the, you know, my ideal democratic world, we would have sunset institutions are built in uh, to any of these programs, monitoring evaluation and a need for uh, confirmation, you know, after five years or three years or some period of time, uh, rather than uh, uh, starting it because it seemed to work well someplace else. Uh, without either the evaluation or the need for reconfirmation. Um, sure. Um, on the, so let me just uh, respond to that point and then maybe uh, come back. Um, so I, I certainly agree you would like to have evidence from multiple places. I, I, I think. Um, I think there's a number of points where we have evidence from a lot of places. Uh, you know, perhaps you know some of the strong ones being the effective price on access, which we have many different geograph geographies, um, and we've got other we've got examples from other things like healthcare that are sort of long-term payoffs, and we've got a theory, uh, some theories behind some of that as well, um, behavioral from behavioral economics and elsewhere. Um, so. 
my view is that on some things like that, there seem to be quite quite a lot of generalizability across uh, across places. Obviously, you need some theory to think about where it's going to be and what's going to be generalized and what's not. You know, we don't. Um, so I don't want to claim that you can get away from theory or that you don't need to think carefully about these things. Um, on um, on you know side point on worms, I think there's that's probably somewhere intermediate. It's, I don't think it's just one study from Kenya. There's Hoyt Bleakley's work on the U.S., but I think you know, I was just talking to Scott about more work he's going to do in China. I think that's very valuable, and it's you know, it would be good to get more evidence from that. Um, um, the uh, you know my own view is that the taking into account the uncertainty, um, the, the, in the areas with high worm loads, since this is so cheap, it's probably a good move to do that. Um, in terms of, of the issues of the priorities, um, you know, I think there's some things that policymakers are going to respond to that we do, and other things they're going to ignore because there's other issues that make it, you know, it's expensive for them, it involves taking on a big vested interest that they don't want to have a fight with. Um, and so we'll get some things re responded to and others not. And I guess it's up to each of us whether we want that to shape our research agenda or not. Um, I, I feel unconditional ca on qual access and quality, I feel like conditional cash transfers are, you know, there's been a lot of policy change on that. But I think that's also largely for redistribution re reasons. We think about the places that are doing that. Um, I, I tend to be very happy that the conditional cash, I mean, they could be done better maybe, and they, but lots of research is going on on how to do them better. I think conditional cash transfers, my personal assessment is that's probably a, a success when you think about it as a policy overall. Um, so why is that? I mean, they, if you get kids to sit in a class and they don't learn anything, why is that a success? So I, I personally, I, you know, I'd love to love to hear your views on this. I haven't seen the research suggesting that this doesn't have an effect. I've seen, I've, you know, when I looked at, at a number of studies, I, I, don't, I don't want to claim for sure that we know that the, you know, about the ultimate wage impact, but the, I think there's, you know, take a place like, take a Duflo's study in Indonesia. This is presumably a quite poorly functioning school system getting, uh, we certainly need more evidence on this. I, I, I don't want to claim this is, is settled altogether, but getting kids into that school system seems to have long-run wage payoffs. Um, what's the impact of, I would love to see, you know, studies on what the wage impact is of conditional cash transfers. Um, I'm making a guess that that's going to be positive. I guess it's par partially also, I'm, you know, I'm reasonably happy with the redistribution and I, I'm reasonably confident that getting kids in school is going to lead to, through non-cognitive channels as well as cognitive channels, to lead to some uh, some benefit, but I agree we need more evidence on that. Um, uh, just, like, just like one, one piece of research to follow uh, this that, that I saw at a conference that Paul sponsored out in Minnesota last year. Esther Duplo has this paper basically looking at interventions that, that promote access. It, it was not just Esther Duplo, but others. Uh, and making a cost effectiveness comparison across these. And basically concluded, looking at four or five or six, Jerry was also there, that, ca that CCTs were the the, the worst by far. Oh, I, tot I don't so, disagree with so that. Yeah, I still like yeah, CCTs. So, uh, yet, yet we see very high demand. So, I mean, you say I don't see any evidence. So that's one piece of evidence. It's, it's on a narrow criteria in which you said, I'm just going to judge them on axis, and I'm going to look at six different things. Oh, no, no. And this I, is the I know those studies. I know that chart very well. <laughs> um, I, I, think that, I think CCTs are good, and all the rest of them are good. So CCTs are, but, there were, but they, that's not what Miguel said. I mean, they, well, uh, why do, why not do what you? what Esther Duflo said. I mean. Wait, wait, no. <laughs> I, I, uh, so I, I guess I, I just, I don't see, I, I'm sorry, you I don't can, see the problem. You can have that answer, but you can't agree with Miguel on, on that point, because I, that's maybe the I did not, Maybe what, what, sorry, I did not understand what you said myself. Basically, what I said was that, you know, we, we throw out different things that are evidence-based, and you know, Esther Duflo had basically looked at five or six things, all of which were evidence-based, right? All, right? all randomized stuff, and basically said, I see one that is distinctly less, less effective. And my point was, that one seems to be the one that has oh. strong demand, right? No, no, now, no. Understanding okay. why that may be seems to me, all I said was that seems to me like an important question for researchers to, to, to think about of, of the things we produce. And I'm not saying that that changes anyone's research agenda. It certainly hasn't changed mine. What is it that has demand? That's all I, 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 I think, so on this, there's a, those were the things where there was evidence. 
Okay, there's a lot of things where there's no evidence, and there's other things with zero impact. Sure. Okay, so that chart did not, so of the things with, if you're looking at the very narrow criteria of narrow cost, you know, you want to get as many kids in school for a dollar as you can, yeah. then, then you would say you would do other things first. And I, I agree with that, I don't disagree with that. Do I think, I personally think conditional cash transfers are a good program for Brazil, Mexico, et cetera. That's part, you know, partly because of the redistributional effect. I think they're much better way of doing re redistribution than what Mexico was doing before. That's my, my guess on that. But um, so I, overall, I would re support conditional cash transfers. I certainly support the other things more. The, I wish policymakers would do that. I don't think it's bad that policymakers, I think I count it as a net improvement in the world that policymakers uh, have done conditional cash transfers. There's lots of other things I'd like to see them do as well. And as a political economy question, yeah, I think it's good to ask when do they respond and when do they not. But I, this doesn't, I see the conditional cash transfer er, experience as a big success for uh, the role of research and policy, not as a, not as a negative. So I, I love this conversation because we keep having it all the time, what constitutes evidence, right? <laughs> Uh, and just to complicate it, you know, you could say we have a lot of evidence of price and access. I could say, well, if I was a neoclassical economist, that would tell me the demand curve is highly elastic. So, you know, Shepard's lemma would say, don't subsidize it, right? So, you know, if we are going to use reveal preference as a measure of welfare, uh, the fact that the demand curve is very elastic in those portions would actually say this is not as good to be subsidized. And that's a discussion that we are having right now in a lot of places, right? I mean, that ultimately, the fact that the poor are very, very elastic to small changes in prices tells me they don't care about this good, right? Uh, so, the, the, you know, so the evidence, the, the discussion about how do we move from evidence to policy, where we have been very active is to say, what, is the, what are the institutions we need to get some kind of democratic debate going on back? And what's the nature of the democratic debate you want to have? Because I don't think it's going to be, let's do this now. It's going to be five years from now, there's something else. 10 years from now, there's something else. 15 years from now, there's something else. And unless those institutions are set up in a robust fashion, uh, I think we are going to, you know, and I don't know what that, what that institutional framework would look like. For me, that's a huge mechanism design issue that I think we, we try and work on quite seriously in all, all the places we're doing. So. Uh, Rick, the, the kind of continuous change model you mentioned sounded a little like the U.S. now where the IES is funding, you know, in maybe 10 years we've gone from five or six RCTs on uh, reading instructional methods to, you know, we have 150 and they're very high quality and they're, you know, insanely expensive. Um, so what do we need to see for a continuous change model where there's enough information at a local level or a country level to inform sensible decisions. Um, this, you know, I'm thinking about Honduras right now where there, there's an incumbent government, or there's a, an election coming, and, and the CCT has essentially sucked all the oxygen out of the debate. Um, there's like one RCT going on, on on one laptop per child. And, you know, there's, there's essentially no debate going on on, say, you know, reading instruction, teacher quality, things like this. So, 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 so what's what our I'm contribution here when, when no, you know, there's essentially no Honduran with, you know, working on any of this research either. It's all sort of people, you know, in this room or at the IDB. So, so I'm not sure how you do this. What I, what I had in mind was not the IES model, frankly. I think the IES model where you put multi-millions of dollars into one single study is not one that's uh, the right model because um, I would rather see uh, small experiments in Dallas and in uh, Denver and so forth where they have a set of alternative reading programs that they don't institute across the entire district, but that they put in into a portion of their district in some cleverly designed way so that they can learn whether they're improving. And this kind of local improvement model that in fact automatically adapts to local circumstances and capacities and needs is what I think is much better than the IES model, which is the one, stu one killer study of X 
uh, which doesn't uh, take you very far because then you never know how to generalize from that one killer study. So one, one of the questions uh, that I've had is uh, we know that uh, administrative reform is pretty central to, uh, to a, lo a lot of uh, the mileage to be gained around improvements, especially in Asia and Africa, I would, I would assume. But we don't really know very much about how to do it. So I mean, contract teachers uh, are incredibly more productive, but they're also uh, increasingly better at getting organized, at getting regularized. And so the long-term impacts on public finance could be massive from expanding contract teachers in the short term. Or you know, teacher performance pay works, but we don't really know how to robustly design a system where the inspectors and the teachers can't collude. Uh, so that would be a case, again, like in India. What would a sensible research strategy even look like for trying to look at these questions which deal with one-off administrative reform and uh, presumably going across the system and presumably over a long enough period of time so that, you know, so that adequate time has gone for learning to take place and coll any collusion to have shown itself. How would we even begin to study political economy questions of that variety? Do you want to answer, or you want to? We should go to the next. Uh, no, <laughs> sure. Uh, sure. <laughs> I was just uh, trying to think. You know, obviously there are many policies that uh, target things like access or or whatever. However, it's uh, we shouldn't evaluate these policies just on the basis of whether they achieve access or not. So when we talk about CCTs, or when we're talking about deworming, clearly a CCT program will have a vast array of uh, other potential outcomes. It's a, it's a welfare program. It's a, it, it might have impacts on health. Indeed, if you look at CCTs, they're not only designed for, for access, right? Because they are given to, uh, uh, to families with kids in, uh, in, in, uh, in age groups where the, uh, where the participation is 100% or 95%. Right, so I think we have to be a bit careful in uh, in uh, categorizing these policies just on the basis of uh, something that we happen to be focusing on at that point, much be access to school, and we should, uh, you know, of course, if it is specifically, you know, a, a, a program is very narrowly defined to to achieve access, then you evaluate on that basis, and of course, our randomized experiments are designed to look at one, two, three, or four outcomes, but we shouldn't lose the big picture. There's a kind of general equilibrium. Uh, feature here, and when we institute a, a welfare program or a, a more narrowly defined program, we should ultimately think about it in, in those terms, even if it is difficult and even if it, is, it requires beyond the randomization, structural models, and, uh, and other thought processes that go beyond uh, RCTs. Um. You know, it's probably probably because I was trained as an agricultural economist in a land grant university, and then spent you know almost ten years. I, that's how I always see what is the role of evidence-based research in trying to change policy. I, I look through those glasses, and it's and it's really two two things. So there's the basic research that's going on here, right? And then I mean, you had you have uh, land grant institutions in every state replicating the big breakthroughs that go come at the national system that then take and adapt and then you have the extension agents that take it out to the counties that offer it out there and and then there's sort of uptake and and, and I think that um, I mean when, when I hear Kardec explain that's why I always keep asking him every time I see how, how do you work what's your and, and you know he's sort of working with the land grant institute in, you know, in India, and I mean, other people here, you guys here too, right? Uh, um, but I think that we don't, we haven't systematized that in, in education and health, uh, like we, like the U.S. and and other countries did in in agriculture research. I mean, it's probably the political economy under that, right? Where you have lots of voting farmers who have uh, this enormous political power, and they. So they track the attention of um, of, um, uh, of um, uh, politicians, but but I think that in some sense that's where we have to go. 
And that strikes the balance between, I, I hear, I hear Michael say, that's exactly, we do know a lot, <laughs> right? And I'm going to say, I hear Rick and say, yeah, you don't want to push this down everybody's throat, you know, so how do you, how do you get through and strike that balance, right? Because you don't need worms everywhere, but the worms are a huge problem and they're so easy to, um, that, that, and there's a way, and then there's a way to implement parenting decisions, that, that, that the parenting I interventions, but, you know, you, you need to have the right uh, sort of environment to, to do that and political will, so it's, um, okay. Yeah, I wanted to say two things. Partly, I agree with some of the things that Carlos was saying. In terms of, you know, uh, it's, it's true for the debate about education and schools and access to learning. But more generally, I think it's true for a lot of the intervention that, 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 that if you think of the role that uh, we have in the economy, I guess for a change, I'm going to come to the response to that. We are a um, What do we do in all these fields? I mean, why don't we? So I think the main uh, competitive advantage that we have is if we think about um, uh, about behavior responses, about markets, about uh, 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 and I think that's that we shouldn't ever, ever forget that. And, and while uh, the evidence that comes out for other RCTs that is extremely useful, I think in terms of what we can get out of that, uh, uh, it's crucial that we models that allows us to extrapolate that evidence and to, uh, and, and to pick, uh, paint the general, general picture, which in, in the case of schools, and uh, I, I really like to uh, um, uh, intervention because it does point out to the need to identify where the frictions are, where the interventions are, in order to correct, uh, to, 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 to interpret specific interventions. Yeah, the second point I want to make, which is somewhat related to that, but it's more general to the, you know, uh, I'm glad that, uh, that Mike has got the same sort of bad news that, uh, that, that, that we have when we, uh, when we see the use and misuse of evidence, uh, 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 state of uh, evidence. The thing is that, um, for that reason, uh, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but on the other hand, I, I did to me this line, um, that chart that Chris uh, referred to, mainly because I think it's way too simplistic. And, and you know, probably you understand uh, what's behind that picture, but it, 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 it lends itself to huge misuse by, uh, by policy makers. And, uh, either because it's misinterpreted, generally misinterpreted, or for vested interests. So I think we should be extremely careful in the way, you know, we shouldn't risk to oversimplify things uh, and hope that uh, that, that is not used. Uh, we should be extremely careful in the way we do uh, things. And that goes not just for the craft, but you know, we're talking about CCPs. I agree with you that a big chunk of CCPs has been, uh, and success of CCPs has been in distribution, but also, you know, the evidence of CCPs has been over the by that, the big success in uh, increasing access, that's not true everywhere. Even in Mexico, if you move away from rural Mexico, urban Mexico, you know, was pretty much in a 